Tedekoto Tefano o Aotearoa Unitarians. Tedekoto na man here. No my, higher my, higher my ki tede fare karakia ate atua. Together, today we gather in a way we could not imagine a year ago, but with the same determination and commitment that is grounded in our, into our DNA to seek a better world and to be the change we seek. Today we gather with a profound sense of sorrow for those who have suffered and will suffer in the future because of climate change. As always, those who suffer most are the poor and marginalized. Let us have compassion for the children alive today and the millions of unborn who will suffer because of our society's indifference, reluctance, and denial. Finally, let us acknowledge our own suffering. None of us can escape. We're all in this together. May our lamentations be a seed that grows into unwavering resolve. If you have a chalice or a candle uh, for our chalice lighting, this is the time. We light this chalice, spark of the original fire of creation, to remind us that we all on this planet, the furred, the feathered, the finned, and the scaled, along with us featherless bipeds, we are all made of the same star stuff, all share a common destiny. We all share the same hopes of a life free from harm and suffering, and the same aspirations of happiness, love, and flourishing. Being able to express our own unique natures and capacities as best we can. We are just that many diverse perspectives from which the whole is seen and experienced. We are inextricably intertwined interconnected and interdependent and it is good now for some of you our opening song uh, is it will mean that it won't feel like sunday instead of spirit of life i thought maybe we needed maybe a small change so but there are words provided oh. And uh, the tune will be familiar to many of you. It's called Boat Home by Peter Meyer. We'll go into our Koha song. Obviously, we don't have to pass plate. So instead of uh, our normal passing the plate, offer up your gratitudes and your commitment. Um, I chose this piece because it's done by kids about the environment and as a reminder of why we are focusing on, on probably the most urgent thing we must face. Uh, as a as a human race once we survive pandemic so i will now play the time is now my reading for today is by stephen schick who has written a number of meditations regarding the environment he entitles this one, Peace Like a River, Strength Like a Mountain. Nature provides ready metaphors for peace and justice. Jesus' peaceful kingdom 
is described as a mustard seed that grows into a large bush, providing shelter to all. The Hebrew prophet Amos cried for justice to roll down like water, and we sing, I've got peace like a river and strength like a mountain. But it takes more than mere words to join nature to action. Truly experiencing ourselves as a force of nature in all its varied circumstance is something beyond just symbolism. The next breath I take is not a metaphor. It is, if I am mindful of it, a reminder that I am a force of nature linked to all the ex that exists on our living, breathing planet. In many American Indian traditions, the medicine wheel honors the natural forces that can guide us into harmony with all living things. Our suffering, our victories, and the passions and beliefs that move us to action are part of a larger system that appears at times to seek harmony and at times to tear us apart. In engaging each fully, we become forces of nature. I've chosen for my musings today, the title, The Carbon Footprint of Faith. I have shared in the past that I was reared by and infused with the values of a staunch empiricist. Yet my scientist father was a highly committed and active member of the Episcopal Church most of his adult life. Furthermore, to everyone's surprise, including mine, he parented an Episcopal priest who evolved into a Unitarian minister. As a teenager, I could not untangle the mystery of how belief in science and faith could be embodied in a single skin. It was a conundrum. It was an impossible juxtaposition. It was a mind-numbing cognitive dissonance. It defied an adolescent's black and white view of reality. I finally asked him to unravel the mystery, expecting the long, usual explanation with footnotes. I still remember his verbatim answer. What can't be proven can't be disproven. In my reflection on that answer, I imagined a Venn diagram. One circle is science, the second circle is faith, they overlap. The overlap science may someday be able to explain. As science creates as many questions as it answers, faith and science are destined to be strange bedfellows for the foreseeable future. The fruits of this coexistence we have seen in Galileo, Copernicus, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Gregor, Gregor Mendel, Louis Pasteur, Blaise Pascal, and the discoverer of oxygen and carbon monoxide, and the first to find a practical use for carbon dioxide, fizzy drinks, Unitarian Joseph Priestley. This is only a sample of the long list of scientists who are also people of faith. So it turns out science and faith are not natural enemies. They both begin as beliefs. As you determine which beliefs are most important to you, they become values you hold. Those values determine how you treat yourself and others and approach life situations. Those then lead to how you act. As a Unitarian, I believe that science and faith inform each other and serve somewhat like a feedback loop that gives us peace like a river 
and strength like a mountain to make the world a better place than we found it. From my perspective, this alliance between science and religion is still counterintuitive. For much of, for so much of history, religion has not put its best foot forward from justifying wars religion started to burning witches, from turning a blind eye to slavery, to encouraging and even nurturing imperialism, from creating ghettos for the Christ killers to keeping the women in their place. The list goes on and on, and we cannot just ignore religion's impact on climate change. Almost nine out of 10 people around the world consider themselves religious. That figure shows that while in many countries, religion is not as dominant as it once was, it still has a huge influence on us. As a marker of identity that transcends national borders, religion influences many environmental relevant behaviors. Thus, understanding religion's role is a key is key to tackling environmental cha challenges that are also fundamentally transnational. Religion influences many aspects of lifestyle that affect the environment. Childbearing decisions and the use of contraceptives risk behaviors and use of health services. Whether people see climate change as human caused or related to forces beyond human control. Consumption patterns and thereby use of natural resources and emissions of greenhouse gases. And willingness to take action to evade environmental degradation. Religion is sometimes defined as the relationship between people and that which they value as holy, often in supernatural terms. All faith share a common ethic based on harmony with nature, although a wide gap is often perceived between the religious texts and the current practices of the adherents of those religions. A surprise to many is that religion has had a major positive influence on the nature, natural environment. Animism, a view of the world found among many traditional peoples, believes a spiritual link exists between humans and nature, leading to the founding of sacred sites protecting nature. The Baha'i faith teaches that the grandeur and diversity of the natural world are purposeful reflections of God. Buddhism teaches that respect for life in the natural world is essential and underpinning the interconnectedness of all that exists. Christianity teaches that all creation is a loving act of God and that humanity may not destroy biological diversity or destroy God's creation without risk of destroying itself. Islam teaches that the role of people on earth is that of Khalifa or trustee of God, whereby humans are entrusted with the safekeeping of the earth and its variety of life. The prophet Muhammad is quoted as saying, there is a reward in doing good to every living thing. Jainism, one of the oldest living religions, teaches nonviolence towards human beings and all of nature. It believes in the mutual dependence of all aspects of nature, belonging together and bound in an intricate relationship. Judaism outlines a series of ethical obligations relevant to the conservation of nature. Quote, take care not to corrupt and destroy my universe, or if you destroy it, no one will come after you to put it right. That's from Ecclesiastes. 
All Buddhist teachings revolve around the notion of Dharma, which means truth and the path of truth. Buddhism cares for wildlife and teaches that the protection of biological diversity is respect for nature and that living in harmony with it is essential. Hinduism believes in the forces of nature and their interconnectedness with life itself. Certain rivers and mountains are sacred as they give and sustain life. All plants and animals have souls and people must serve penance for killing plants and animals for food. The Bhagavad Gita presents a clear description of ecology and the interdependence of all life forms from bacteria to birds. The teachings of Sikhism are based on the premise of life liberated from conspicuous consumption. Shinto, the system of indigenous religious beliefs and practices of Japan, is strongly rooted in rural agricultural practices with ceremonies and practices that guide the relationship between people and nature. Societies with declining biodiversity are seen as being in decline themselves. While religions teach an enlightened approach to relationships between humans and humans in the natural world, their adherents often pervert or ignore them. It reminds me of a cartoon of Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, Buddha, and Kali in a support group, with Jesus lamenting their common need to be spared from their followers. Only one example of these, only one example of these followers is required. White Christian evangelicals in the U.S. Embrace, embracing Trump's demagoguery, homophobia, racism, climate denial, xenophobia. And yet, in spite of the followers' failings, we can't ignore 87% of the world population because they are religious. Those who value preservation of the planet need to mobilize religious leaders to promote positive ways their faithful are called to combat climate change. It can be done successfully. Pope Francis, a scientist himself, has already had a major impact on the thinking of Catholics in this regard. Another highly successful intervention can be seen in Tanzania. On an island off the coast, fishermen had been using dynamite as a quick and easy way to bring the day's bring in the day's catch. But this method of fishing is very damaging, destroying coral and killing immature fish and turtles. Local conservation organizations tried to educate the fishermen on the harms of dynamite fishing, but this fell on deaf ears. The government then banned the practice, but again, the fishermen took no notice. Then, ARC stepped in, the Alliance for Religions and Conservation, ARC, is a secular body that helps faith leaders to create environmental programs based on their faith's core beliefs and practices. Members of ARC realized that all the fishermen were Muslim and that the local sheiks had a lot of influence in the community. So they showed the sheikhs passages in the Quran that promote pro-environmental behavior and told them that dynamite fishing goes against these teachings. The sheikhs spread the information in their community. And as devout Muslims, the fishermen listened. One local fisherman said, I've learned that the way I fished was destructive to the environment. This side of conservation isn't from the Zungu, that's white man in Swahili. It's from the Quran.
So what is the carbon footprint effect? It will depend on those of us who, whose faith perspective leads us to value earth justice and to act accordingly. Unitarians have a pretty good history of being on the right side of this issue. Where we have failed is in trying to go it alone with the 13% of the world who don't identify as religious. We're all too likely to believe science alone will save us. We say we honor the wisdom of the world's religions, and yet we tend to favor humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science, and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. Unless we can overcome this bias, and embrace other religions as partners. Our faith will help destroy the planet. Well, I hope that invites a lively conversation in your breakout groups. Um, and so I'm gonna offer you this question to begin with. And they go where you will, you will. How can you expand your faith in service of the planet? How can you expand your faith in service of the planet? So my closing song is one of the newer ones um, in our continuing this singing the living tradition. We've sung it in church a couple times now, uh, and it's called the Fire of Commandment, number twenty-eight. And now it's time to extinguish our chalice or candle. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. For our closing words, love our earth. Take action, consume less, use less energy, respect water, and be cooperative, collaborative, and creative. Our children's lives depend on it. I wish you all the best this week, and uh, delighted to have our international congregation and so I'll see you in one form or another next week.